Hello, hello! Welcome to the first episode of Code and Coffee Show. I see that Nate is already preparing for the coffee part. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, today I have my great friend Nate Finch and we will dive into the wonderful world of serverless function and we will learn what we can do with them. I mean, it's quite cool what we can do without having a server, right? Because it's all about serverlesses, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Nate Finch is a full-stack developer at Elementor. He's helping bring static, secure, speedy, and scalable WordPress to the masses. He's also a speaker, educator, and a coffee lover. And uh, until this point, he's the only person from all the guests I had with whom I had the pleasure to drink coffee in the real world. That's um, right. I had a chance to drink one in Porto. I remember you probably had an espresso, and uh, me together with my wife, we had a... Probably a, a V60, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was like a pour over. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It it was an interesting uh, place because it was uh, half a coffee shop and a half a clothing store. Yeah, clothing, <laughs> yeah, which so, seems very dangerous if you're drinking coffee in a clothing shop. Yeah, so. but <laughs> but we managed we managed without spilling anything uh, on, on the clothes. So yeah, great success. So. Uh, like we all know, uh, coffee is one of the most important thing for every developer. And uh, as we already know too, that you are a coffee lover. So what is your favorite type? And uh, yeah, so let's start with this. What is your favorite type? Yeah, so um, currently uh, my favorite kind of coffee to go and get is a Cortado. And there are lots of places. So I live in Fitchburg, which is really close to Madison and Wisconsin in the United States. So for reference, it's about two hours north of Chicago and it's supposed to snow like seven inches today. So I'm not going out today, but um, <laughs> I usually like to go get a Cortado. Uh, it's one of those drinks that has, you know, it's like basically espresso and then a bit of milk, steamed milk, um, but it's not a lot like a latte. Um, so, it, you know, you get it. I think it's like a six ounce, maybe a four ounce uh you know, pour usually in a, like a glass, like a double shot glass kind of looking thing. And um, so there's a little bit of frothy head on top, but it's mostly just like milk and espresso and it is so good. So that's usually like my litmus test for how good is this coffee shop? This, how is their Cortado? But, um, but at home, uh, I usually like 80% of the time I'm doing like an Americano. I have an espresso machine uh, as well at home. That's just kind of a, it's a nice, you know, little uh, consumer one, not a professional grade one yet. Um, so I usually will pull an espresso shot or two and then uh, dump some hot water into it and have an Americano. So this one's actually decaf uh, from a roaster that's in Texas. Uh, that was close to where my parents used to live. And uh, yeah, so I still drink it. It's a sugar cane decaf from Merritt Coffee Roasters. Very delicious. So cheers. I mean, I can tell you that I'm also a big fan of, of, of Cortados because, yeah, they are not too big. Uh, and oh, so this uh, this bit of milk changes yeah. everything. That's so, so great. Uh, so, so that's true. But uh, I can tell you that, uh, and, and, and this is the sad thing about um, not having this show in person, because the coffee I have with me, it's a barrel-aged Rwanda from... Oh, uh, yeah. Barrel yeah, aged and, everything, and, and, <laughs> exactly. Barrel aged everything, and and, and I had uh, I had the pleasure to talk with with the creators, and said that, and they said they had a small problem with with the barrel because there were a bit of sugar left and it stayed on the bean. So yeah, in general, you can feel so many tastes inside. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, and uh, you... so 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 I can I, I can tell that my, my coffee is a bit better right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just might be. Uh, is it, do they, do you know where they source the barrels? Are they uh, bourbon barrels or whiskey barrels or? This one was from, uh, from Porter Beer. And if I remember from rum. So, wow. So it was okay, both. So... It was both. It was both rum and porter. So it was so, rum yeah. first, probably, and then they aged porter beer in it, and then they exactly. put coffee and, in it. Wow. And, 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 <laughs> yeah. So really, the taste and the smell is, oh, is yeah. totally That sounds amazing. Totally amazing. So I, I really hope that next time I will have a chance to 
bring it bring some with me and when <laughs> me we too. When, when we'll meet uh yeah well uh, we'll have a chance to drink it together uh awesome. yeah yeah so uh before we will dive into the topic of uh, serverless functions uh yeah someone has to pay for it and i am the lucky one <laughs> that i have a, a very very generous sponsor which is uh, kinsta and the next uh, i think 15 or 20 seconds is on them. So see you in a, in a second. Kinsta's application hosting simplifies the work of modern web developers. With just a few steps to get your app up and running with performance backed by the fastest Google C2 machines, Kinsta has built a development platform designed to get your applications in front of users as quick as possible. Test Kinsta's application hosting for yourself at kinsta.com. The first twenty dollars are on us. And we are back. So yeah, now it's time to talk about serverless functions. So why should we even bother about this? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons to use serverless functions and serverless services. I'll draw a distinction probably between those two. Um, basically how I think about it is that you have functions here. They're doing one thing, you know, typically, uh, although, you know, developers, we don't always do like one thing in the, one function and stuff, of course. <laughs> so, you know, you've got your functions that are doing things and then you can pull a bunch of different functions together and create services. So maybe it's service, like, um, we'll see here that it's like a remote kind of post holder database. So you have like a uh, couple of functions, you have a database that is uh, out in the cloud, and then you have like an HTTP uh, API that you can interact with and send requests to. And then that goes to your functions, your functions grab data out of the database, just like you expect from, from a server. But you know, you don't need to have a uh, $5 a month like digital ocean droplet for doing that all the time. That's way too expensive. <laughs> so um, for like basically like what, you know, the, some of the things that we're going to see today, you can, you know, get by with, um, you know, on the free plans of like Netlify or very, very absolutely no cost, basically uh, on Amazon AWS, uh, and then other things like uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, you know, all these all these other cloud services as well. So uh, the reason I to think do we that also is also have Versal and the Cloudflare pages. Right. They also have yeah. their Absolutely. And they also yeah, have yeah. a generous uh, free plan. And uh, because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also a big fan of those. When I yeah. see free plan without any credit card, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Right, <laughs> right, right. I mean, so you can get started on this, all, all this stuff for basically free. Um, and then at least Amazon, uh, you know, if you're just getting started, they have like a, like a free tier for a year and stuff like that. And it's really for much bigger scale stuff than like what we're talking about right now. Although all of these things could scale instantly, which is another reason to use serverless, right? Because, you know, if you have one server that's serving all of your stuff up, uh, that server could get bogged down. If you have a bunch of traffic, think Black Friday sales, or you're releasing a product or something like that. So there's a lot of um, good that comes from being serverless because you're scaling on somebody else's uh, network of services, right? And that uh, platform like AWS or Google Cloud Platform or something like that, those can all be scaled pretty instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say infinitely. I'm sure that there is some kind of a limit. Uh, there is a finite amount of resources, but it's not something that anybody's really going to hit. Um, so th th there's a lot of good to uh, all of that. And then we have, we're have we going to look at this in the context of static sites, right? So we have static serverless services um, so for your sites, right? So why do we do static? Well, we do static because we want to reduce security vulnerabilities. We want sites to speed up. So that was a big thing with like Gatsby or Next.js or you know anybody else that's doing all these static site generator uh, kind of stuff um, or you know anything like that. So we want mm -hmm. our sites to be fast, so speedy. We want them to be scalable. We want them to be secure. So we're doing all of this stuff that, uh, especially coming from like a WordPress background, uh, most of us are very familiar with like slow speeds, uh, and not to say that WordPress is slow because that's not true. Um, but it can be. <laughs> yeah, it can it be can very be. slow. Um, but you know, WordPress itself is pretty fast, and uh, but and WordPress itself is very secure. Um, the core, like the core framework, right? So it's the things that we do uh, as developers, or the things that we do as users that are you know clicking and installing a bunch of random plugins, never updating things. 
not keeping up with like PHP version updates, like all that fun stuff, right? So there's a lot that goes into it that when you go into a serverless uh, environment, you don't worry about or you offload to somebody else. So in this case, for example, Netlify takes care of scaling your um, you know, functions and everything, but it also takes care of patches, updates, like all the, these kind of things. And all you're doing is using their compute power on their mm -hmm. like servers that I think that they ran off of AWS. So, and all of those things happen, like you can call a function uh, for fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a, of a cent, you know? Um, so it's like incredibly cheap to borrow compute power for however many milliseconds you need it for, and then be done with it. So a lot of pros yeah, to it. There's also cons, but we don't have to talk about those because this should just be like all, <laughs> you know, butterflies and rainbows. <laughs> Yeah, and the, so. and, and, and the cool part about serverless is that we can uh, have our static website, which is like blazing fast because they're, I mean, I can't imagine creating something quicker than just the HTML and CSS and some JavaScript and make it a bit dynamic in some right. cases. And, right. and uh, but still, like the core of our website will, will stay static so it will be as fast as possible but those small little parts all over the website like for example pricing based on localization which we will show yep. uh, can be dynamic or having this breaking news that will just pop up we mm -hmm. also show it how how to make it right so yeah how exactly how we can how we can do this yeah, so um, I'll, I can start like showing you all some, some code and some services and everything. Um, the first thing that we'll start out with here, uh, and I guess I should say that um, all of this is like all the code at least is available on a, you know, in a, in a repo on GitHub here. Mm -hmm. So serverless services for serverful CMSs. Um, and what we're going to look at are two different examples. And these came up. Uh, so I work at Elementor. Uh, now, uh, which has a plugin that is free for doing page building in WordPress. They also have a pro, pro, pro plugin that you can purchase. Uh, and then there's also cloud hosting uh, with them to host Elementor sites and really fine tune them to be a lot faster. Um, so last year they acquired Stratic, which is a company that I've been working for for uh, almost two and a half years. And Stratic does um, like pre-generated websites uh, based on WordPress. So you'll see how this works in, in a little bit, but to kind of give you the overview, you basically go static uh, from WordPress. You, they we take your site and scrape it down and make a static site, generate all the files and stuff that are needed for that, HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, and put those out on a CDN so that it's everything that we were just talking about. A serverless site can be fast, scalable, secure, all that kind of stuff. So um, these kind of are proof of concepts that came out of my time working there. There were several more that I developed, but these ones are uh, pretty fun. Uh, and they both show kind of like a more entry level way to develop your own kind of serverless function or serverless service. And then also you can see, we'll see a little bit more of a intermediate, I guess you could say, uh, an example of how to develop serverless services um, for static websites, right? So all that code is here. And uh, we'll be looking specifically at Netlify uh, functions and ed edge functions, and then also be looking at the serverless framework in AWS. Um, and I will say that I put this together before, uh, I want to say like at least the serverless framework part, before uh, the serverless application model from AWS came out and was like really uh, solidified, I guess you could say. So they've made a lot of improvements there. So this could easily be done on something like SAM if you're wanting to be on the AWS framework or serverless, or you could do this and apply this to, you know, Google Cloud Platform, Azure. You could probably do this on something. Uh, well, this is going to have a database, so I don't think you can do it on uh, Netlify Functions or Vercel yet, but you could, you know, pick your service, basically. I'm sure kinda... that you can do it on, cloud, on Cloudflare pages because they shared some time ago that you can use a database. So this oh, well, there you go. Thing. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I haven't tried it on Cloudflare yet, so that would be really, that'd be really cool because they've got a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, so yeah, so the, the, these are all the kind of things that we're going to talk about. So the first thing that we're going to look at are basically edge functions on Netlify. And... These are, I believe, still in beta, uh, but they're pretty stable. And um, they have a lot of examples here that you can use. And I'd ask for a show of hands how many people have used Netlify, but you know, 
So maybe magic, <laughs> you, maybe you've <laughs> used Netlify. Um, but it's basically like you can take your code repo, uh, push it up to GitHub, and you can have it connected to Netlify, and it will automatically deploy uh, your repo. So there's some examples here, hello world and stuff, but we're going to scroll down here to geolocation. So why geolocation? Um, static websites typically are not coming with that information. Uh, if you, I, I have a PHP background. Uh, if you have a PHP background, right? Like uh, we know that we can get like some of that location from PHP, PHP libraries and stuff like that from the server. But what do we do when we don't have that server? Um, so you know, we've we've had several clients uh, before on Stratic where they have these like geolocation IP targeting stuff going on, mm -hmm. um, but they can't do that on a serverless platform because their integration is on PHP. So, you know, what what can you do here? Um, well, one solution, and uh, again, these are just proof of concepts. This is not actually what's in production uh, at Stratic, <laughs> but these are like just the ways that you know you could go about thinking about the problem, right? Um, so one solution is to use a service like Netlify, uh, their edge functions have geolocation like abilities built into them. So what does that look like? If we scroll down here, this is, you know, just a super short function. And what this is doing, uh, is this, this is creating a function. This is in TypeScript. Um, but basically what this is, is, uh, saying that when we get this information in, so somebody pings this endpoint, this is going to be an API mm -hmm. endpoint. Somebody pings this endpoint with some information. And what they're going to do is take in that request and the information, and they're going to have a context to that request. And this is the important part that most uh, HTTP requests don't have on your typical static site, right? Is this context. And so what Netlify does is that adds in this context and adds to that context uh, geographic uh, information. Mm -hmm. And that can be seen, yeah, all the way up here. Yeah. Excuse me. So you can see, uh, you know, that I'm coming back as in the US and here the country code is US. I'm in Madison. These are my coordinates if you want to come visit. Um, and, and that my time, time zone is yeah, central. So I mean, just the time zone is also something so useful. Yeah, I can absolutely. imagine. The, the moment when you are running a schedule for some event and you would like to serve all the times based on... Right, right, right. So, and sometimes you can't, you're, most of the time you're not able to get that from a typical HTTP request, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just going over the wire. So the context you can see here, they have this all commented out, but it comes with city, country, subdivision. So this would be uh, something like, you know, state. Uh, I think this mm -hmm. comes up as state in the... Uh, in the JSON response. Mm -hmm. uh, so stuff like that, latitude, longitude, which you can see here, and then time zone. So um, so this is really good because now people's sites that are static um, and specifically sites on Stratic <laughs> uh, that are static <laughs> can uh, take advantage of this and see where a user's coming from and then load the specific data uh, that, that they need. So um, we've had a couple of people I say we, I don't work on Stratic anymore, uh, <laughs> but we, it's a habit that dies hard. <laughs> um, they uh, have come over from like WP Engine or they have, you know, used something similar to this in the past. So this is like a, this is a plugin and this is not like a dig or anything at WP Engine uh, <laughs> as, as well. So uh, this plugin is really cool and helpful, but it's really only available on their platform, right? Um, so what it does is you're a lot, you, it gives you this short code. And if you're in WordPress land, you're from, probably familiar with short codes and you're able to wrap text or whatever content you want in those short codes. And uh, then it will display uh, based on that. So you can see here that this is kind of like localized content. So you wrap it in this GOIP content short code. And uh, if you mm -hmm. only want people in the US to see it, then you would tag it uh, with this attribute country equals US. And you can add like a comma separated value to this. We'll see how this works in just a second. But uh, then only people in the US or that their IP is showing up as in the US. So, you know, VPNs totally can get around this and stuff like that. But the basic idea is that um, if they're coming up as in the US, they would just be see seeing this kind of thing. So previously this works, and this is a plugin that's, you know, open source plugin, it's available and everything. Uh, so if you go through the code, it's all PHP, right? It's all just working 
uh, actually on their servers, right? So this is something that integrates with their server system. Um, so uh, we kind of took this and since this was used on like several sites that were asking for this, this is kind of the API we implemented. And so it's basically mm -hmm. um, people could come over and not have to take all those short codes out. We'll just like use those same short codes um, and everything. So uh, that was kind of the idea behind this proof of concept. So what do you need uh, to do all this stuff? You're going to need like local, at least for local development, you're going to need to get Node installed uh, on your computer. So I'm assuming that a lot of people probably have all that installed that are watching this. Um, and then you're also going to uh, need a Netlify account. Uh, so, and that would look like, well, you can go to Netlify and then sign up here. And uh, once you do, you'll create like a, an app and assuming that you've hooked it up to your GitHub repository, that's what this looks like. So um, this is actually hooked up to the GitHub repository here. And you can see I've included a link here for mono repos on Netlify. Since this is basically a mono repo for these examples, um, if you go down into here, you'll see Netlify Edge Snoopy demo and then uh, Stratic. Yeah, Stratic yeah, GOIP right. plugin. Um, so I probably should change that to static and not Stratic. That's also a misspelling <laughs> of Stratic too, man. Developers and spelling things. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it, it's hard. Again, yeah. It will start hard, fixing right? that all the time. So we don't have to worry. Absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so this is where your Netlify service is coming in. Um, so you have Netlify, and we'll look at this in the code and everything. But just so you know, this is all a mono repo. And this is all actually um, the deployment for that is built on this netlify.toml file. And it's just saying, hey, go here to get your information for, for building, right? Um, so that's how this, this will work. Uh, the, the breaking news example will be done on AWS. So really, the only service that's happening here is the GOIP service that we're going to be looking at. So. Uh, so let's get over here. Um, there, this says like Netlify Edge and Snoopy. Snoopy is also a service um, that does uh, geographic uh, IP stuff. They give you back a lot of information as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I tried testing it yesterday, and I, it's not working. I couldn't log in and <laughs> everything. So hopefully, you know, uh, they're they're okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, whatever. So we're just going to focus on Netlify and focus on Edge functions, but. Um, just so you know, if you've never used Netlify functions before, you would basically have in your project a folder that says Netlify, or it's called Netlify, and then a functions folder. And then you can put your whatever function you want to use in that folder there. So similarly, if you want to use an edge function, which is what we're using now, because the edge functions are the ones that have the geographic information on them, mm -hmm. you would have a folder in your Netlify folder called edge functions. And you can see that we just have this geolocation.ts file. It is a TypeScript file. Um, but honestly, you don't need to know TypeScript to be able to copy and paste this into a .ts file, save it, you know, push it up to your repo and have it deploy. So as you can see, this is basically um, the same exact thing, right? Uh, we just copied this over from, I just copied this over from Netlify. I haven't changed it. I just took out all the commented stuff. So uh, what this means is that, you know, when they have a request, the request will mm -hmm. come in. It'll get the context from that request. So it'll have my IP uh, address going in on that uh, context. And then it will return uh, this new response and stringify back in this uh, geo property, mm -hmm. um, everything from the geographic context. And then if you want, you can obviously change your uh, cores access here. We just got this open for everybody right now. I will also be taking all of this stuff down <laughs> after this demo. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, access all the stuff, uh, you'd pr really only be able to do it during this demo. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll be taken down afterwards. So uh, there's there's that. So this is all the code. So if you're in, you know, uh, if you're using like something like Source Tree or GitHub Desktop or uh, Terminal or something for your code management, you'd basically, uh, you know, get add everything, get commit, get push up to your repository. So uh, I feel like don't need to demo that. Um, and then what will happen is that when you get to uh, your app, you'll see uh, if you have functions and edge functions, you'll be able to go here for the function specifically, click on the function and 
uh, it has the endpoint for it. So uh, this isn't going to work though because the Snoopy service isn't working <laughs> right now, or at least it wasn't for me. So uh, we'll go back to Edge Functions, and you'll see that Edge Functions is still in beta, um, and it doesn't have your um, your URL uh, for it. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that it is. So page not found, but if we go to geolocation. There it is. So this is the edge function that has been deployed. This is the JSON coming back. I'm pretty sure this is coming back and with, and formatting the JSON with like a extension, Chrome extension. So this, this is the Arc browser. Uh, if anybody's like, why is your sidebar on the side? What's going on? Um, this is Arc. Uh, so like it runs on Chromium. So uh, Chrome extensions will work on it. So anyway, this is the geographic stuff, the same thing mm -hmm. that we've seen before. And this is the information that we can parse. Uh, I will take a little pause here to just say, this is one of the things I have loved about web development in the last, I don't know, five to seven years. I started out doing like custom, you know, WordPress sites and stuff like that. And once I started getting clients asking me to integrate with like APIs and things, it could be anything, a Stripe API, a Google Docs API, a whatever API. I was like, what? I don't get this. And then once you kind of realize that APIs are all about like getting and sending information, um, I don't know. It was like one of those, like, I love working with APIs. It's all information. Once you have information, especially in like a JSON format or something like that, but you know, even if it's in XML or SOAP or whatever you're doing, as long as you have that information, you can parse it and you can do whatever you want with it. Right. Uh, it's kind of wild. And so, uh, I just, nothing, sometimes nothing makes me happier than getting a bunch of JSON data back. <laughs> so but, especially yeah. it's organized. <laughs> but this is something I, I, I want to confirm that this is, uh, yeah, because having all the, all, all this data, it's, it's like all why the internet is here. So we can exchange the information between right. one point Absolutely. and another uh, in some way. And if we can not using such a nice approach, we can scrape it and convert it to an API. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. But so but yeah, this is this is like the most uh, amazing thing about the whole well, the whole internet. Let's be honest. We can just right. exchange everything with everything, and it will work in some magical way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so great. Uh, so yeah, that's anyway. So just enough about APIs, but it's also really <laughs> cool too that Netlify has a service like this where you can just basically grab the code that you need from their examples, you know, and deploy it. And then it's there. Like you really don't have to worry about all this. And here, I guess I'll pull this up too. Um, slash pricing. Um, talking about pricing earlier. And I think it goes all the way down here. Do, 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 do functions. All right. So wait a second. It oh yeah, here we go. Like... Edge functions all the way at the bottom. So you can see like even at $0 a month, you get 3 million invocations, right? Now, if somebody's hammering this right now, that's not great. <laughs> um, please but... don't do that, obviously. But, uh, but it's a lot. You know, it's, it's a, a lot. lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so, and that's free. And then it triples if you're paying just $25 a month. So the thing is, is that if you're getting to this like kind of level, it's like you're really onto something or you're getting like hammered by bots or, you know, spammed or whatever and stuff. So um, 25 bucks a month for all those invocations is not a lot to ask. Um, and it's even, I would say even cheaper on AWS. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where you're just like, man, this is, this is almost nothing, you know, it's not going to be free or whatever, but like, it's basically nothing. So we can get this up and running in, you know, five minutes basically, mm -hmm. which is really awesome because it's not only something that like we can use to demo uh, to like a customer or a client or something like that. If you're working on some kind of project for somebody, but you can get things just up and running and then you have it and it's, you know, a globally distributed scaled like system. Right. So really, really cool. Um, anyway, back to, back to the code. So let's see like what we're looking at here. So we've got all that and that's fine. So what I'm going to do is close this up close this up. So we're in our GOIP example folder and we're going to go into the strata, uh, the static GOIP. <laughs> I'm going to rename this really quick before I forget. So there we go. That's the thing with working with static is that anytime you want to say static, you have to like think. Three Stra times yeah, I know. About what you're Although, talking about here. A great name. A great name. It, it, it fits perfectly. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so if you've done any, um, WordPress development and any kind of custom plugin development, you'll see that this is a super simple, like again, proof of concept plugin. Um, and it has three files, an index file that kind of starts it all off. Uh, and then some extra customizations, uh, that we'll just say, and then, um, the JavaScript that's working on the front end. So, uh, before we dig in more, let's just kind of see what this looks like, uh, on the website. So, no, don't need this anymore. And we'll go over here and just open up the dashboard. Let's get this in a new tab. All right. So <clears throat> we have plugins. I'm going to close the sidebar for a bit. All right. So we've got our plugins. We've got our uh, static. Our was, static. Here, here we go. See? Here it was named correctly. Yeah. Correctly, right? <laughs> I mean, geez, at least. So um, this is also why it's really good to have plugin or uh, code reviews and stuff for with people that spell better than me. Uh, I'm pretty pretty well known for misspelling things all the time. So okay, we've got our plugin, and um, what this is doing. We'll go to a page, and I've created a pricing page here. So this is on this is on a WordPress install that's on a server, right? And this is all on Stratic. Um, so you can see this little Stratic icon. Um, this is this icon right here. This is what we would use to deploy this page to Static, right? Um, so we have this pricing page, and um, it has our GOIP content uh, country uh, bit here. And so it says, like, if you're in this country, in the US, UK, or Spain, let's say, um, you're going to pay this price, $99. Uh, but if you're not in those three countries, uh, everybody else is going to pay euro, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this works just fine on our, you know, on our server-based WordPress install, which we would expect. Um, so what, is that, what does that look like here? Let's go to view preview in a new tab. So here's the okay. price you will pay. Exactly. And you can see, I'll, I'll refresh it again, but you can see that it kind of isn't there and then it pops up, right? So obviously like these are caveats. This is a proof of concept. Uh, you'll want to look at your core web vitals, you know, cumulative layout shift, et cetera, et cetera. You'll hear me say that again uh, when we look at the breaking news example. Again, this is a proof of concept. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you, you could have something obviously that's uh, laid out and everything, pricing table that has everything and has basically a blank or like loading or something like that in there so you don't have that cumulative layout shift or anything like that, right? Um, so cool, you can, so again, you can see like once I refresh the page, it you know flashes a little bit and then it goes in there. So what's happening um, in the code, and we'll just like briefly explore that in, in a little bit. You can, oh, well, you're not gonna see it on the fetch XR, XHR thing uh, because uh, I've got it stored as a cookie as well and I'll walk through this. But basically um, we have the page load and then we, let me delete this really quick. So now if we go to network tab, we do a refresh, we see this geolocation. Yeah, it, yeah. So there's our, our URL for our endpoint. And then we have our response here and we can preview it and you can see all the stuff that we were seeing before, like two times already, <laughs> right? So now we have that information and our code parses that. And then it also will store it in the application under GOIP info. So. For example, this isn't the best way to test these things, but oh man, if I can actually edit this before it like saves. <laughs> so, oh man. Okay, well, good thing I have it saved on the static site. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, so we've got this on the server. We expect it to work on the server, um, but this wouldn't work out of the box with the short code on a static site, right? Because the short codes are only for PHP stuff, uh, exactly. really. So. Uh, if we go to the static site, which on Stratic is, you just change this guy here to preview. Okay, so now you can see that we're not logged in and that we're on the preview site. And, oh, no, I didn't save it, looks like. Okay, so anyway, what's, what's happening here is the same thing. We've got the GOIP coming up and the country code is US. And um, yeah, so it's coming back as US dollars. Again, let me see if I can just quick edit value. GB. Should oh, wait, be no. UK? UK. That should be, well, it was a, was a UK. 
So there you go. Oh, no. so it should be should be UK, but it's not. And so if it's not UK, it's showing. Oh yeah, it was Euro. else. Yeah, if else. yeah. So it's showing our Euro price now. So um, this is basically a very tiny service that you can create, um, and we'll walk through how this is created in just a second. But uh, now you can see that if they're coming up as something that's not like US or that you don't want people to pay US dollars for, um, mm -hmm. that it's going to show up in euros. All right, cool. So what does this look like in the code? So we have, um, we'll start off with the index, so very good place to start. And basically all this is doing is calling this customizations uh, bit. So we'll go over here and scroll up. And we like you can see that this is, yeah, less than, yeah, less than 75 lines of code. <laughs> so uh, we're doing a couple things here. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is doing uh, the constructor here. Wow, so many spaces. Oh, look at all that. <laughs> um, so we're enqueuing our script. If you're familiar with WordPress, um, you know, you've probably seen WP and Q scripts before. If you're not, the brief explanation is that uh, WordPress tries to be smart about how it loads JavaScript scripts because we don't want to have something load before it's load after it's required. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if exactly. you have something that you, you have code here that you're depending on for this to run, but it runs here, then your code's not going to run or you're going to get an error or something like that. So WordPress tries to be smart about that and enqueue those things. So uh, the, the classic example of that is a jQuery uh, thing. So if you're uh, if you've ever gone to a site and you look in the console and there's like an error and it says jQuery is not defined or dollar sign is not defined, it's because jQuery is not probably being loaded in the right order or at all. <laughs> and um, the thing that you're trying to do with your custom code with jQuery, toggle or whatever, um, is just not coming up. Uh, so it's running into your jQuery thing or your dollar sign. It's saying, what's this? I have no reference for this. So in Qscript is, is trying to, to deal with that uh, kind of thing. So uh, then we're adding filters. So these are specific to Stratic. Um, and uh, we're... Let's see here. I'm trying to think. We might not actually need these. So, yeah, that is actually not needed. That I think is actually not needed either. Cool. So, I'm just gonna comment these out. This is this is a great thing about the proof of concept is you're like, why why did I do this again? <laughs> um, okay. So now what we're doing is we're doing a couple of things. So we've got a short code that we're adding here, and then we're creating a REST API endpoint. Uh, so WordPress for the last seven years, five years has had a built-in WordPress REST API. Um, and that basically allows you to read, you know, do all your basic CRUD app, uh, application functions, uh, mm -hmm. create, read, update, delete things uh, via an API. So, and it's a JSON-based API. Uh, so what that means for us is that we can create our own endpoints where those endpoints query uh, posts or something, our specific posts uh, that we want to have queried or um, we can just have random data in there, which is going to be our shortcode data, actually. So then we got this uh, GIP content uh, shortcode, and it's saying basically anytime you see this shortcode prefix here, GIP content, uh, run this function. So the function is pretty pretty simple and straightforward here. Um, we've got any attributes that get passed in, so that's going to be your comma separated values in like the country or not country attribute and then any content that is between them. Uh, so we have the short codes here and here and then any content that goes in there. So in our case, it's the price uh, that we're trying to show. And yeah, so that's how that works. And then <clears throat> we're also uh, referencing, so we're uh, saving, how do, how do I wanna say this? Get option pulls information from the database. We are storing information in, in this particular option. And so if there is anything it'll come back, otherwise uh, send back an empty array. So we're basically storing all of our stuff as an array. That's going to get in our JSON or our REST API endpoint is going, that array is going to be output as JSON data. Um, so that's the content that we have. So what we're doing very quickly is that we're taking our attributes and we're basically saying, okay, for each of those, we got a key value out of them. And we're creating a hash so that we are able to create a, uh, We'll see right down here, this div with this index, hashed index of what it looks like. So when the page loads, there are a few empty divs that have these hash IDs on them, these hash data IDs on them. And so they could be the same uh, if the content is the same uh, or they could be different. So basically uh, what's happening here is that we have an array that we've created 
up here. Sorry. Wow, that was a fast scroll. Okay, so <laughs> the array that we've created up here. And then we have uh, an index for it that we're creating with uh, via an MD5 hash. This is not like a security thing either. We're just hashing things. So I'm just using an MD5 hash um, and getting the value and the content. So why, why use a hash, right? So we want to make sure that it's possible that you would have like two different points on a page or 10 mm -hmm. different points on a page where you have the exact same code and content and, you know, attributes or something like that. So the, if we want, if we have that same short code happening, that same pricing happening on multiple points of the page, we don't need to have 10 different array items, right? We can just have it in the same array item because it's the exact same content and a hash is a way to figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the same. So basically, if it's the same hash, it's going to overwrite itself. So then it will have the key and it will uh, explode out the value based on the comma separations. So this is why it's a comma separated list, right? Uh, for the countries. And so all that gets stored. <laughs> so we have a uh, key and then we have the content. The content gets stored as is. So this is, again, the price, the $99 or you know 89 euros or something like that. And then we update that option. So that means we save things back to the database and then we create this div um, that gets returned. So whenever the short code runs, this div is what's gonna be returned is an empty div. Again, has a class of GOIP targets. All right, <clears throat> this scripts is just saying what script to load and we'll look at that script in a little bit. And then, whoa, fast scroll. And then <laughs> here is where we register our rest route. So WordPress has, has uh, an like basically a PHP API for registering uh, REST API routes called register REST route. And that is uh, the first parameter here is like a namespace. So we have static, st static, <laughs> I had to triple check, uh, <laughs> GOIP content. And then um, it will, what it will do is it'll get that option uh, that we had up here earlier, right here, same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's getting that array or an empty array, and then it's gonna JSON encode it. And this is just saying, like, don't worry about permissions for right now. So this permissions callback is something that WordPress uh, implemented to if have something basically like if somebody's logged in and they're an admin, they can access it. But if they're mm -hmm. not an admin, they can't access that route. So we're just basically returning it as empty so that basically anybody could access this route. Um, OK, cool. So we've got these here. So let's go back to this guy. So this is our static site. So I'm going to go up here to our WordPress site and I'm going to add here our endpoints. Oh, so this should be, let's see here, WP, JSON. Yeah, here we JSON. go. JSON, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So now you can see that we've got this hashed index. We've got the countries or whatever coming back and we've got the title or the content, sorry. Um, so one thing you'll see here uh, right off the bat is that we have show this, don't show this, show this, don't show this, show this price. And uh, so <clears throat> what you can see that I'm not doing in this proof of concept is cleaning up, right? Uh, so we're just trying to get- There should be a trim. There should be a trim at least. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so um, so this, this is a REST API endpoint. This is great because this is static information. Right, so that means that we can publish that uh, to our site, and so basically what this is doing now is that we will send this and have this route be published um, when the when the site is published to static. So this information will be available publicly uh, to be sorted through. So uh, this is where I would say like don't do this if you're trying to have like top secret information. <laughs> uh, on these sites, you're probably going to, if you have top secret information, you're probably not going to want to do what I'm doing right now. But if you want to have a static site that is a little bit more dynamic, that shows certain things in like, a, like you know, a geographically distributed way uh, for different people in different parts of the world, then, you know, check this out. So, um, okay, going back to that, uh, what this then does is allows our JavaScript to start interacting with it on the preview site. So, <clears throat> Now, when so this is again on the preview site. Uh, when this when this loads, we uh, we have a JavaScript call going out to that endpoint. So let's go back to the code. And we'll go over to our JavaScript file, and this this file is a little bit more intense, just over a hundred lines, um, and a lot of it is like 
getting the code and these are all you know javascript objects or whatever uh and methods within the object but basically what we have is um we're basically checking to see if there are ids sorry checking to see if there are divs with mm -hmm. this goip class on them on the page if there are we want to make a call out to uh the goip content um so that looks like this where we're fetching from our endpoint that we just looked at and we're getting that response and then uh we're getting the json from that response and passing it back up to the object handler so then we go down and like replace the divs and then um one of the things that you'll see is that if there are divs on if there are divs on the page that didn't mm -hmm. have a hash ID that matched them. They'll just be there. They'll just be empty divs. And so remove extra divs would be like a cleanup for that. So uh, that's what's happening. So really quick, kind of going through the meat of this. Sorry. Also, this is the like get cookie store cookie. And I'm going to be honest. Uh, I got this from good old W3 schools, right? Uh, so this, you know, because JavaScript doesn't have like this nice interface for setting cookies and stuff and getting dates and everything like that. Uh, W3 schools has this tried and true <laughs> little, uh, set cookie, get cookie method thing. Uh, and then you can, uh, check the cookie this way. This is not W3 schools. This is me. So <laughs> yeah, if it looks like a computer wrote it, it's from W3 schools, right? So basically it's saying like, set the cookie if it doesn't exist. Um, and that cookie has our information in it, um, that we've gotten back, um, and all that. So, uh, and it expires, I think, every 24 hours is what I have it for. But you could set that to a different mm -hmm. uh, time interval uh, based on your needs because maybe you're updating prices like every two hours or four hours and stuff like that. And you need all that information to be fresh. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's what's happening there. And then basically you're going down and uh, getting all the divs from the page that have that G GOIP content class and storing those. And then basically at that point you have your data from your API that we've seen the JSON stuff. You have your divs data, and it's basically just saying like, okay, how do these match up? You know, um, so it's replace the divs if they have uh, co country like if they have country the country option, <laughs> or mm -hmm. if they have the not country option, right? So um, basically, do replacements and all that and everything. This is all, you know, I'm sure this could all be refactored again, proof of concept. So, <clears throat> and then that's what's happening. And then you're just uh, waiting for the DOM to load for the whole thing to execute. Again, 100 lines of code. Uh, but what this ends up giving you uh, on the end in a static environment is a geographic, um, geographic IP locator service that, uh, you know, you can roll out in a day, <laughs> not even. And if you have a globally distributed client or a customer, uh, this is something that can really help them. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's already a short code API for them to use and stuff like that. So um, again, this is like a proof of concept. This is not what it has been implemented on Stratic. <laughs> so I don't want to <laughs> give that impression. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's example one. How's how, how's it going? <laughs> how's yeah, it's. Doing? <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is this is exactly what uh, I mean. This is the problem with static websites, right? We don't have access to some data, and just yeah. one simple function, and ta -da, we have this. Right, right, and you know, like I said earlier, this is all for like public data, basically stuff that you want people to be able to access. So if you have some kind of of need for like some kind of auth or some kind of um, I don't know, something else like that. <clears throat> You're going to want to also implement authorization on top of that. Or if you have um, like the edge function, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, if you have another API service that you're interacting with, uh, for example, so I've done this before with, um, so this is for like static websites that aren't headless. I would define like a headless website uh, as something that has a WordPress backend that is accessible. Um, mm -hmm. In this instance, uh, on Stratic, for example, the WordPress website itself is not accessible. So it's kind of headless uh, in the sense that you're building from WordPress and making it static. But a lot of times you'll see headless websites be um, something like, a, what was it, Rudy's was the, was the kind of case study example for this, where it was using Next.js um, as the application layer. So mm -hmm. have Next.js deploy that um, to 
a Netlify or a Vercel. I don't know where they deployed it. And then you have a WordPress backend that has WooCommerce on it. And then they're doing all their uh, WooCommerce transactions via an API. Uh, so they're basically hitting, hitting an endpoint and they can get all that information and set up a cart, set up a checkout, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's basically, at that point, WordPress and WooCommerce are acting as an API service and not as a front end or like a full stack application. So that's more of a headless site. This is definitely um, for more st absolutely static sites that don't have WordPress available to them at public runtime, I guess you could say. <laughs> so this is definitely yeah, the static like serverless it. combo coming in together. So awesome. Um, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> I understand totally everything. <laughs> awesome. OK. So that's. Um, you know, that might have, you know, people have been like, oh, that's super simplistic or some folks might feel overwhelmed about all this. Um, I think like this, I, I've got, I don't know, I was doing this kind of stuff like five, six years ago at an agency that I was working for where we were building out websites on Gatsby from WordPress and then trying to figure out, okay, how do we integrate like a uh, Gravity Forms with this? Because they want to use Gravity Forms. So, you know, all that to manage their entries. So then you can have um, like in this, in this edge function, for example. So cool, you're getting this geographic information, uh, but you're, you know, you can still interact with your WordPress site and you have a gravity form that needs to get submitted. So potentially they could submit to a service like this, an edge function service. And you have, you have to have a gravity, like a gravity forms API key uh, at least you did six years ago, <laughs> to be able to uh, submit to Gravity Forms via the API. So, but you don't want that API key out on your, you know, public uh, website, right? So you can hide stuff like that, um, environmental variables, uh, private keys, or whatever, in a function that's running not on somebody's browser, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this would be running out in the cloud. So you can ping that service with the information that needs to get sent to the form. You know, kind of. Uh, what do I want to say? Like basically get, get all that information squared away together and then send that back to your WordPress site with the Gravity Forms API key that you need to submit it to Gravity Forms. And then when somebody who's managing all of those form entries uh, and responses, uh, they can just log into their WordPress site just like normal uh, and check all the Gravity Form responses and you would still have like email notifications going out from the WordPress site all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so that would be like one way to kind of think about next level for this. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be Gravity Forms and WordPress. It could be something like a MailChimp signup form or mm -hmm. another form. 80 zillions of forms that you can think about, right? <laughs> yeah, because so let's be honest, uh, this is, I think, the most popular question when we have every time when we talk about static and how to handle forms. Yeah, exactly. So, and there's, and this is just like one of, hundreds of ways you can handle forms in a static environment. You could use HubSpot forms or base forms, I think was another one. Mm -hmm. They're base form services, right? You can hook stuff up to Zapier or whatever. Well, Netlify has a, or, something out of the box. Yeah. And to, right, right. Yeah. Netlify forms right out of the box. They just handle it for you. So yeah, and that that's one of the things that um, I think back in, you know, back in the day, like with Gatsby just starting out, they were talking about this content mesh, right? Where it's like, mm -hmm. just find the best tool for the job, right? It, it could be WordPress. It's probably WordPress for content, especially if you're working with like, you know, content marketers or people that are building out a lot of that stuff. Um, but maybe you don't want to use any of the form solutions. So go pick another form solution. Or maybe you don't want to use WooCommerce. You want to use Shopify. Well, use Shopify for your e-commerce and, you know, WordPress for all your content stuff and then put them together with like, a, they would say Gatsby, but, you know, something else, right? So, yeah. Groovy. Yeah, it's groovy, it's, groovy. It's, it's it's all about this, the fact that we, we we are building something out of bricks and we can at any point start changing them. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so let's take a big breath and we'll go on to this next example. If everybody and a okay sip of coffee, that. don't don't and a sip of coffee, of course. A sip of coffee. So we cheers, cheers for you, right? Yeah. What Nastrovia, right? Nastrovia, exactly. Nastrovia. <laughs> there you go. Um, cool. So now this this is another example. This I would say is a more intermediate example. We're going to use AWS services for this. So we will have, and we're going to do it through the serverless framework. 
So there's a lot of different ways you can do stuff on AWS. Um, you can do everything through the AWS console, which we'll, you know, maybe check out here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, <laughs> you could you could use the console or you could uh, do all this with like infrastructure as code and stuff like that. So uh, when I did this first time uh, a couple years ago, uh, I used the serverless framework for that. Mm -hmm. um, and now there's like AWS SAM available if you're using AWS stuff. Serverless framework has um, plugins and everything for different cloud services. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so let's get let's get started on this. So what does this look like now? Um, this came out of, and I call this a breaking news example because this came out of a um, conversation with a potential customer uh, at Stratic to, oh, what is that? let's refresh this. Um, this came out of a uh, conversation with a customer that is a, like a, was a statewide, basically media agency, media organization. So they do like news. Uh, so you think of your local news, um, for you know, a fairly sizable city, but that news also went out to like the rest of the state, and then they also have a publishing platform along with that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what they their big question because with uh, Stratic you have three different types of publishes: you have a full, full publish, quick publish, and now a selective publish. So these are what they sound like. Full publish is that you're you know, scraping We're your whole thing. everything. Yeah, just replacing everything, right? Or just like- And if you have a it. new site, it might take a while. Let's be A honest. ton because, of time, right? Yeah, because uh, creating static websites is amazing apart from yeah. the build, the build. Part. Right, With, when exactly. Every typo when you realize, yeah, let's rebuild everything again. And again, again, and, and again, again, and again. Yeah. And if you if your news organization is publishing hundreds of articles a day, it doesn't make sense. Um, so like, that's a full publish, right? A quick publish is basically saying like, okay, what have you updated since the last publish? We're gonna just update that. So it's quicker than a full publish, right? But they brought up the, the case of like, well, how would we handle breaking news, right? And we still have like a selected publish available and stuff like that. So selected publish is basically, I want you to, to publish this one like URL. So, you know, whatevernews.com slash cool breaking story I want you mm -hmm. to, to publish cool breaking story uh, and nothing else, like nothing else will change on the site, right? So then those get done in under a minute, right? But more could happen in a minute, <laughs> right? Or like, you know, what if there are 20 people trying to do a selective publish all at one time or something like that? Um, so how is this gonna work? So they basically were like, ah, I don't know, right? Um, so one of the things that we came up with um, was this other proof of concept for breaking news websites? Um, so basically, what they said they needed was, you know, the they could update and edit the story as it's developing, and that it would basically just appear on the website. Cool, great, sounds like a really good uh, opportunity to use something like serverless <laughs> to to do that with uh, with our static website builds, right? So we have this, uh, and so again, this is the on on the right hand side here. This is the. Uh, uh, the preview site you can see here and then this is the site with wordpress on it with since we're editing on this site here so <clears throat> um basically the idea then is that you could have this and you can uh i'm on a max so i'm doing command s but you could do like control s just save it you don't need, you know click an update just think about like how somebody's covering an article they're writing stuff out writing stuff out hitting period hit save and this is the homepage. This isn't actually the article. Sorry. Okay. So <clears throat> now that we're actually on the article, <laughs> you can see the post updated on the WordPress side and it's here, but I haven't had to republish anything. So still updating article, save, and it just shows up, right? So what is happening here? Um, <laughs> and, and then magic. magic. It's yeah, pure magic. absolutely magic. So let's say that they had... <laughs> I don't know, they were doing a breaking news article on this you know, painting piece, right? Image address, get back over here. So in WordPress, you know, WordPress land, you'd probably just use like image block, and then we'll just say insert from URL. <clears throat> it's that there. Of course you would add, you know, alt text and everything um, to it. But like, if you click save on that now, so we've got our post updated and there. So again, all without refreshing and everything. So you can look at this and think, this is a simple solution. He's just polling. 
that's exactly what I'm doing, right? Um, all I'm doing is I have JavaScript on this page, on the preview site, on the static preview site. And every five seconds, I think, it's asking the service that we're going to look at creating, mm -hmm. hey, is there new information? Or give me your <laughs> give me your updates and stuff like that. And so uh, you can see that we have like a last updated here uh, so that it can be showing last updated. But yeah, so how, how could this work? Uh, and then again, this is where I would do the caveat of this is breaking news. So this is something that would not be really indexed. Shouldn't be, I guess you could say shouldn't be indexed um, at the time, but you could you could imagine um, here if I just move this over a little bit more, a button here that says like move to archive or you know make article. So on the WordPress side of things, we have a breaking news custom post type. And if you're not familiar with WordPress, WordPress has an API with a bunch of boilerplate code. You can actually do this through a plugin um, and everything that you can just create custom post types as you need them. And then they will be automatically registered in the WordPress database. There's very little work you have to do to do that. It's one of the really cool things about WordPress. Um, so yeah, so we've got these breaking news things, but then you could you know, easily see that you'd have an option here or an option on the page to just say, uh, make post or make article or whatever you're you know, calling your articles at your news organization and stuff like that. And then it would change the post type in the database and it would basically go in and then it would be something that had all the SEO stuff along with it, that had all of the archive stuff with it, et cetera. So this is just for breaking posts or breaking, <laughs> breaking posts, <laughs> breaking news <laughs> updates. Um, and then again, the same like cumulative layout shift stuff. Um, we're basically like, you know, saying that somebody is on this page and they're watching it refresh, election results. Uh, whatever, right? They're just kind of watching it refresh. As it refreshes, it's got, you know, it just loads back, loads onto the page where, it, where it's supposed to be, right? So we've seen it work. Let's go check out the code for this and talk through it a little bit. Okay. Um, so we've got our serverless uh, folder here. This dot serverless is what's generated by the serverless framework. Let me go back really quick and say, go over here. So this is serverless.com is the is the web address for this. And uh, basically what it allows you to do is have a code-based project that you can deploy uh, through their uh, dashboard to the service of your choice. In this case, we're gonna use AWS. Um, this is great because what it allows you to do is basically say uh, via code and config files, these are the services that I want to use. This is how I want, you know, and for Lambda, the function service uh, in particular, this is how I want the Lambda to work, et cetera, like all that kind of stuff. So um, basically I'm just using this framework um, and I think that the getting started guide, basically all you need to do here is NPM install globally serverless. And then it'll walk you through all this stuff of what to do. So, um, I think that move your service, function logs, invoking a function. So you can also test locally. We won't be doing that. So one of the things in like the serverless community is like, how do you how do you run this locally? Because <laughs> everybody wants to work locally, right? Um, and the argument to not do that is because mm, your computer is just your local computer. What you want to do is test and make sure that the function is running in the cloud, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do that with serverless the serverless framework in particular and serverless stuff in general mm -hmm. um, that you can create your different stages. They call them stages in this. Uh, so dev stage, a testing stage and a live stage or a production stage. And you can deploy your functions uh, once you update them or something like that to the dev stage and you can test them there. Um, and we'll see here in just a second, like how to do that. But basically uh, if you're updating, you have like an initial kind of serverless deploy uh, and that is going to go through and configure all sorts of stuff in cloud formation. With this is all with AWS, so cloud formation, H, the HTTP API gateway, um, lambdas. We're going to use DynamoDB, um, CloudWatch logs, like all sorts of stuff, right? So um, all that stuff is going to get configured on your initial deploy. But if you edit a function, you come over to the terminal here, and SLS is is shorthand for serverless. So you would type out something like SLS deploy function, and then it's, uh, I believe it's dash F and then the uh, name of function. And we'll see that here in just a second. Cool. 
so let's uh, let's check out this code really quick. So there's there's a little bit more to it, um, but not too much more. <laughs> um, and mostly the thing to kind of get right and struggle struggle through, I guess you could say, is going to be this serverless serverless .yaml file. And this is basically your config file, right? So uh, your organization is going to be um, what, like, kind of your general organization here. And let me also uh, so do SLS dashboard. Oh, maybe SLS login. Let's try that. Do that. Huh, am I not logged into this? What the heck? <laughs> Weird. OK. So what it'll do is log you in and got this. So continue to dashboard. So this is the dashboard that they give you to monitor your app. So we'll look at this breaking news service app. So um, right here, just so you can see how the config file lines up. So I'm in my N8 Finch org and I have an app that's called breaking news app and I have a service that's called breaking news service. So you can see how this stuff works. If you want to create a new app, you can select something from like a existing project, or mm -hmm. you can go through and see if you want to use any of their starters. So if I've got an existing product project, uh, what I'll want to do is run the following command in my terminal and everything, and then uh, it will deploy this, right? So pretty cool how integrated and easy to use this is. Um, but just so you know that that's what this dashboard is. This dashboard is basically free to use. Um, I say basically because I'm not sure the ins and outs, but they also have a paid version of this that I think has more features as well. Um, so you can see like your API request stat. You can see just a ton of stuff. All of this is getting pulled from AWS. So you do need to integrate with AWS. I'm not going to show you how to do that uh, at this point, but um, they have documentation on how that all works. So, um, but that's all part of like uh, the setup here on the setting up stuff, um, configure AWS credentials and set up the serverless dashboard here. Um, these, I have these two other uh, references pulled up. Uh, we'll be looking at the serverless uh, YAML one. These are also in the uh, code file here. Um, sorry, in the readme file for the mm -hmm. code repository. <clears throat> so serverless.yaml is where you're setting everything up. So we'll, let's, let's peruse through here. So basically, you're saying that, and I'm not a YAML pro <laughs> at all. So no one is. Saying, let's be honest, right? no one is. Right? This is like where like half of the breaking stuff is like when I'm trying to like build on build on all this. Like, wow, YAML is just like not configured right, or I got something wrong or whatever. So basically we're saying this is the table name we want to use. This is for DynamoDB. We want it to be a breaking news table. Uh, the provider is uh, we're using AWS. Uh, we're have a Node.js 14 runtime, which shows you how <laughs> old this example is. Um, <laughs> And then we've got uh, IAM roles. So IAM roles are identity access management roles in AWS. And they basically say who has permission to do what. And so what this is going to do is set up roles for um, the service that this is creating to allow database queries, scans, get items, put items, updates, and deletes uh, to items. So all of your basic CRUD op options and operations. And then um, what resource it's going to be using for that. Um, yeah, so then you also have uh, like these these variables getting set up. Uh, so it's saying like, what environment is this for? The DynamoDB table, table name, this is from up here. And uh, this is also, you set, basically this will deploy to uh, the dev stage by default. So if you have like, a different stage that you want to deploy to, uh, you can you can change that. I'm only going to be talking about the dev stage right now because this is not going into production or anything like that. Uh, so no need to have multiple stages. Okay, cool. Uh, HTTP uh, API course set to true. So basically, like you can access this um, uh, from any website <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah, so then <clears throat> this is where we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the thing. So there's the functions. Uh, these are Lambda functions. So we want uh, we want two different functions for this. So basically, uh, behind the scenes of what we're doing here is we're cr creating a uh, breaking news article, and that is a post. And what we're doing is we're going to send that uh, post content to the Dynamo DB table 
service. So what's going to happen is that we create our stuff, we save it, we get the post ID and the content from there. And we send that in a WP remote post request to the service. What that does is it hits the HTTP API with that information. And it says, is this a, po is this a post or is it a Git? And if it's posts, because we're creating something or updating it, um, it's going to go to the post, the up creator update Lambda. And mm -hmm. then uh, if it's a Git, it's going to go to the Git Lambda. And those two different things are going to say, OK, this is the information that we have. So a create is going to take the post ID and create a, a table item with that post ID and the content. Super simple, right? It's like two column database. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, if it's a Git, it's going to have the post ID reference there. So it'll, it'll know where to get that uh, ID from. <coughs> So that's how that works. And we'll just check it out in the code here. Um, yeah, so Lambda functions, uh, mm -hmm. we have our create handler here. And that maps over to create.js on the create function. <coughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I've been doing a lot of talking. All right. so. Um, we want, so basically we're saying uh, for this create function, this is the name of the function, we want to use this handler and we want uh, these events to, these are the events that we want to handle. <clears throat> so if this is a post event and it goes to this path here, so we're hitting mm -hmm. whatever this URL is slash breaking news with a post uh, command and the information, uh, it's going to go to this create uh create function. Same thing with the git. <clears throat> if it's a git method request and it goes to breaking news as slash ID, then it's going to get the information and return that. <coughs> so um, past that, we have our Dynamo DB table uh, here. And this is basically setting it up and saying that we, um, we have basically two columns here. Oh, sorry. Attribute definitions and key schema. So this is basically saying that we have an ID and um, that, yeah, man, this is, I'll, I'll be honest, this is the, the hard part about setting up DynamoDB <clears throat> with the serverless framework is that um, some of this gets kind of convoluted on what we're doing exactly. So basically yeah, this is uh, I only see the, see the ID and that's it. Kind yeah. Of. So the ID and then um, the attribute type is a string. And <clears throat> this is saying, like, how are you referencing this, I guess you could say. So you're referencing things by ID. Um, and that's a hash type reference. And I can't remember the differences um, mm -hmm. right now for, for AWS DynamoDB. But <clears throat> that is basically saying that it's kind of, it's kind of like where you have um, – it's a NoSQL database in the sense that it's like it's, mm -hmm. it's unstructured, so you can keep adding – columns right i get um, it yeah yeah so it's but it's all just going to be referenced by the id so when i want to get something out of it i need to give an id so i can get all the information back <clears throat> so um basically past that it's pretty straightforward uh as far as like um getting things so this is the we'll do the create one first so <coughs> We are, so basically this is like, I want to say like almost like boilerplate stuff here um, where we're creating this, uh, this is the create event. So we have the event that we're getting in just like before. Mm -hmm. um, there's the context there. Uh, this is different context than the, in the Netlify context, um, but very similar. And then a callback function. So what we're doing is getting a timestamp um, just to be able to update that and uh, getting the data that's sent over. So what is the data that gets sent over? Glad you asked. So we've got the plugin, and this is the plugin that's on uh, the WordPress side of things. So again, a uh, an and index so, file that basically... Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Question? No, 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 no. I, 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 I saw the data that you were pushing through, I think, when you scrolled. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so ah. send news item to serverless. <clears throat> this function is called on the save post breaking news. So save post is an, is an action hook. And if you want to do it on every single post, 
You can just have it would be just a safe post, exactly. Right. But if you want to do it on a specific custom post type, you add the custom post type slug. <coughs> Wowzers. Sorry for everybody whose ears are hurting right now uh, because I'm <laughs> coughing into it. Um, so this is what happens is basically we take the post ID and the post. So this is like uh, the post object and we get the content from that and we create an, an array of arguments here. So an event ID and a content uh, attribute, I guess you could say, key. And uh, we send that over with your typical uh, remote post request. <clears throat> so this is very similar to fetch if you're coming from JavaScript world. Um, so we're saying that this is a post request and it's going to this address, this URL, and um, it's sending along these args and it's a JSON application type. So uh, those args are in the body and that is what is coming through here. So we're getting the body yeah, from the event. The body, exactly. Yeah, and from there, so we wanna make sure that it's a string or whatever, or it's, if it doesn't equal string, <laughs> then we wanna come down here. So <clears throat> uh, at this point, we've got the data event ID and the content. And we're doing a created and updated at um, here. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see that this is also like a, uh, uh, th there's an issue here that it's going to like have, it's going to keep updating the created at time. Again, proof of concept. So yeah. And then it's going to put in the Dynamo DB table here. Um, yeah. So store it. And then but in general, we can say that this DB is kind of, um, let's say kind of a cache barrier between our website, which could be accessible normally, but we don't want to uh, ping it constantly because uh, yeah, it would be like a small denial of service self-made attack, which we yeah. don't need to do. <clears throat> That's why every time when we are saving uh, something, we are pushing it uh, to AWS that should handle uh, much higher traffic than our small website. And uh, yeah, it's like this extra layer that's preventing our website to get, uh, well, bugged down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in a sense, we are kind of, <clears throat> I mean, we are pinging this thing every five seconds, right? So, uh, but it's not going to do like, we're not going to DDoS our, our, our own service with that, probably. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for the setup. So what this does is it creates a, um, you know, two Lambda functions here. Mm -hmm. When you deploy this to AWS, it creates two Lambda functions and and a DynamoDB table. And um, once you get it all set up, you send that post information from when the when the post saves. <coughs> you send that over to DynamoDB. It saves it there, and then. It just gets it back out whenever you need it. So you can see this is a little bit more of a complicated service than our previous example of geolocation. Mm -hmm. um, and you're getting into the realm of like database storage and like persistent data and stuff like that. So what you won't see on here is like a uh, delete thing because maybe you don't need to delete it uh, you know, from the database. You could after it gets like that button that I was talking about of like convert to post mm -hmm. or convert to article. When somebody like hit that, if somebody hit that, for example, uh, that could also send a, a request, like a delete request out to this service to delete uh, that post from the breaking news uh, thing. So that would keep your DynamoDB database lean, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but DynamoDB like scales like crazy. So you probably don't need to do that, <laughs> but you sure can. So um, going back to like the, uh, the plugin here, the rest of this is the the like the JavaScript stuff, but this uh, breaking news post type <clears throat> is all basically boilerplate code from uh, the WordPress Codex, the WordPress developer resource stuff. This is all it takes to create a brand new post type. Again, one of the cool things about WordPress is you can just do this. Um, now, do you want to be overloading your post table? That's another thing, but yeah. a lot of times, you know, that's in the minuscule uh, amount of WordPress users and stuff like that. So um, yeah, so there's that. And then breaking news service, this is also uh, fairly straightforward. It is, yeah, less than 20 lines of code. So all we're doing is uh, doing this refresh feed 
this refresh feed gets called uh, on the set timeout. And then, uh, yeah, if there's multiple uh, containers, like you can have multiple div containers of your mm -hmm. uh, breaking news feed on a page, uh, for example, um, it will go through and refresh all those uh, and stuff like that is the idea there. So yeah, all we're doing is fetching to that service and um, getting the response back and then finding the uh, then data cons timestamp date. So find the news element there and do and adding uh, the last the updated moment. The which what? And adding the last updated timestamp. Right, right, right. So for the timestamp there. And yeah, so <clears throat> all it's doing is replacing that inner HTML. Uh, and then, oh yeah, going for every, every three, three seconds, seconds here. Yeah, so even faster. So you could change that uh, there, I guess. So, you know, the breaking news containers here. Uh, yeah, so that's what happens when the page loads. Simple as that. Um, but that's basically, uh, like I said, a breaking news type service that you could create very, mm -hmm. I would say very easily. Uh, but, you know, first time you create something like this with like serverless or whatever, it's, it's a bit of a slog, I guess you could say. But once you do a few of these, it's like, oh yeah, just add on. So... There's like your typical hello world example where you can just do a hello world Lambda function that comes back from uh, an HTTP API endpoint mm -hmm. there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, or you could also take this and expand it to, like right now, uh, you'll notice that on the this, this one, for example, this image, I had to copy and cut in uh, a URL right from uh, a website that wasn't this website. It was from you know one of the Openverse uh, images and stuff like that. So this image is not coming from my website, but it's coming from another website. But the flow would probably be something like somebody drops in an image here and that gets stored on their WordPress. Or in this case, you could add in an S3 bucket that stores yeah, so the images so that it can, so, be, so it can be uploaded to a accessible accessible exactly place. exactly or Cloudinary or whatever. You know that's where it's like. Find the best service for the job. Is it S3? You're already building out everything else on AWS. Maybe you just want to use S3 object storage and have all the images that are in there be publicly accessible. It's pretty pretty straightforward to do that. And that way, this would come up as an image from your S3 bucket. Or do you need to do yeah. some kind of transform on it or whatever from Cloudinary? That kind of thing, right? So, or team. any other I service mean, like that. This is also the thing about, uh, about going... Uh, mostly static Jamstack because it's all all related in a way, uh, you have to kind of change the way of thinking. I mean, yeah. for me, it was very difficult because at first it was like, yeah, but we could do it like, like do it in PHP out of the box without setting everything. So yeah, uh, we are kind of re like reinventing the wheel in a way because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we could just do it. Uh, yeah. But you, when, when you start thinking about performance and and many other gains, uh, yeah. But it it kind of requires uh, a huge uh, shift in, in in the way you are thinking about your about your website, about how right. you are storing everything and where. At the end, and suddenly, uh, it's not a website that is where everything is stored in one place. It becomes mm -hmm. this whole web, this whole mesh. Yeah, this right. this, this this was a, a really good uh, description by Gatsby. Of, right, uh, it's a mesh. Yeah, Every and yeah. yeah, and I would say too that I've worked with companies uh, through the marketing agency that wanted everything on AWS. Right. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, okay, yeah, put everything on AWS. Um, now we got to figure out how to, you know, do these services on AWS or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're not like left to pick the best tool for the job in that sense. Um, Cause maybe it's not AWS. Just want to say it. <laughs> so it could be something oh, yeah. else, or maybe, you know, you have a, I don't know, ethical moral compass that prevents you from being on AWS or Google cloud platform. Google Cloud platform or something like that, oh, yeah. which is totally fine. So finding a different solution, right? Um, again, I, I, I say this a lot in like presentations that I give that uh, the problem isn't the problem. The problem is how to think about the problem. And mm -hmm. I think that if we have more of these kind of tools, um, serverless framework or Netlify or you know anything from DigitalOcean all the way to Stratic or something for doing this kind of work, um, 
and we just know that these different options are available to us, we can say like, hey, what's the best tool for the job, right? Not everything's a hammer um, and that kind of analogy, right? So yeah, good things. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and, and and of course, when it comes to like like we mentioned at the beginning, there are many many ways how you can uh, handle playing around with the ser servers approach. Uh, yeah. If, 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 if even Netlify gives us uh, two two ways of doing it, like uh, a, a typical edge functions and uh, those normal uh, functions, uh, and every provider give us give, give, gives us something so we can uh so yeah this really opens uh, this nice rabbit hole in which we can <laughs> jump in and uh, and discover a totally different world uh, in which we can handle uh way uh, things that uh, yeah seemed simple a few years ago right because we just we could just echo the data or the price or whatever. <laughs> and right now we have to use some weird things to yeah, to do. Uh, let's be honest, we are doing, a, w w when we go back to the pricing example, we are doing a simple if, but with a twist. Exactly. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not much more complicated than that in, in the end. <laughs> In the end, yeah, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, but but of course the gains are huge because uh, when 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 we take a look from the performance point of view, we can have a static website. Mm -hmm. with this only small dynamic part, so we don't have to have a whole dynamic website. Right? Totally, where we have to think about some yeah partial <laughs> caching or something. Uh, I mean, right. Everyone went and throw the throw and we know that partial caching is like uh, it sometimes works, mostly doesn't, and uh, we have a lot yeah. of a, a lot of problems. And going uh, going serverless uh, in the end, especially when it comes to to maintenance, it's simpler. It's mm -hmm. just simple. Totally. Yeah, and <clears throat> I mean. You know, I'm I, I'm just typing in the whole like destroy <laughs> the services uh, so they're <laughs> gone and off of AWS. But it's really just that simple, right? Like you know, uh, just set it up, and when you don't need it, just tear it down. Um, but you can think about like, <clears throat> hey, it's it's probably easy to do this on like a PHP server, right? Just spin up another like whatever DigitalOcean droplet, or if you got shared hosting or something like mm -hmm. that, just add a new account and do it that way. But <clears throat> then you're still responsible for all the traffic that you get. And this is something that can just scale up and scale down as needed and all that. And you, obviously you're still responsible for that, the invocations and that, that kind of traffic, but it's something that you don't have to worry about, you know, like mm -hmm. you just don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so I, mean, I think that's, that's part of it. Until, too. Un until the moment when you seal the invoice and. <laughs> yeah. But I've been doing this kind of crazy stuff or whatever, like, you know, proof of concepts or whatever. And, uh, you know, these things have never really amounted more than like two bucks, even if I screw it up really, really bad. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's really nice. Now, if you are an organization or a hosting company that's running on AWS and all that other jazz, those invoices are a little different than, than oh, what yeah. we're talking about that's here. True. But on the other hand, if you are part of such a company, you don't care because the card is connected and you just play around with stuff. <laughs> yeah. In most cases, at least. That, and that's where, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. I would say that's where most developers could could learn to, uh, to if, you've, if you've only been a developer that's worked at a massive company that seems to have an endless bu budget, but you've never done any kind of freelancing where you are the company, um, <laughs> <laughs> then that's you like are the a, budget and you are the yeah budget. i am the budget right it all stops at me and i want to make sure that my costs are as low as possible and stuff like that so yeah this uh you know going serverless or something like that can also help reduce those kind of costs like dramatically mm -hmm. um for for different services depending on what you're using and what you what you have to do so yeah yeah exactly yeah so uh nate thank you very much because uh those were those were very interesting cases, and uh, that 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 shows that um, yeah, static pages can be dynamic yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. So, That's fun. so thank you, thank you very much, and um, I hope that all of you enjoyed it and uh, soon will try maybe 
I mean, probably try with with Netlify or Cloudflare because they are like totally free and not with, with without this case that after a year you will get yeah. a small invoice from Amazon because you yeah, well, for sure. forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It yep. happens. It I happens. agree. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so th thanks again. And yeah, I hope that we will have a chance to, uh, to meet soon and, uh, be awesome. and have a chance to drink this amazing barrel aged Rwanda. <laughs> yeah. This, I, I'm drinking just this terrible, <laughs> terrible coffee compared. <laughs> I was so happy about this coffee. <laughs> Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't really tell you that this Rwanda is so amazing, so amazing. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks again, and uh, thanks everyone for watching, and see you in about two weeks. Have a great night or day. <laughs> Bye. Bye, y'all.